So you may ask, how do we pick Hot Science Cool Talk speakers? We just stop people and say, hey, you want to give a talk? Not quite. We have a set of, of criteria. Include, are they innovative in terms of their community outreach? Are they outstanding teachers and communicators? Is their research on the cutting edge? Are they world leaders in their field of research? Is their topic of wide interest? In order to introduce uh, Professor Julia Clark, I wanted to show you how we evaluated her in this case. And we could fill this column up really, really deeply, but I want to give you just some examples of, of this. So in terms of community outreach, she won a pretty prestigious award from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for her outreach, so that's a big check. She passes that. Is she an outstanding teacher? She won the Knievel Distinguished Teaching Award at UT, among other teaching awards. Big check there. Is her research on the cutting edge? She won the Outstanding Research Award at UT. She won this prize, the Orville Prize, for the best PhD in geology at Yale University. Another big check. She keeps hitting it. This is a topic of wide interest. She's talking about secret lives of dinosaurs. What do you think? Should we put a check there? Yeah. Of course we should. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Julia Clark to talk about the secret lives of dinosaurs. Please join me in welcoming her. So um, I want to first thank Jay and Melinda and everyone at Hot Science and Cool Talks and all of you for coming out tonight. It's really truly my pleasure and a privilege to speak to you today. So we're going to talk indeed about the secret lives of dinosaurs. So let's get to the beginning of the presentation. Are you guys ready? I think this mic's on now. So when we say we're going to spend some time with dinosaurs, dinosaurs have mostly spent the most time coming to life in our imagination. And so from imagining them as these oversized lizards shortly after their first discovery, and through time imagining them as sensitive or vicious or even highly intelligent creatures, We've imagined how they might move, what they might look like, and even their colors and other aspects of their behavior. So it's truly a... It's truly an honor to explore their secret lives with you today and what you know, science has to say. So, you know, although we've had these dinosaurs in our imagination for so long, we're going to banish them here. And if I can find Manny's hand here to shake it, we're going to send them back to where they belong in our imagination. And we're going to move from our vision of dinosaurs, how we've chosen to make them come alive, to ask the question, how do we use science to explore these aspects of dinosaurs' lives we want so much to know about? So in fact, the most fundamental thing we've got to do is start with the fossils. And these are the bony remains of dinosaurs and other animals that we've collected all over the world. And what we do is we use a language of bony bumps and tubercles and little features on these bones, and we, we analyze those features from many, many different dinosaur fossils. And we even take apart our known for playing with our food. Because, in fact, we can't just look at dinosaur fossils on their own, but we have to take apart living animals and make sense of how flesh relates to bone, how these features can tell us a story of relationships. So if we want to ask this question, can we tell what dinosaurs look like? We're going to bring this toolkit to our problem. So we might go back to those first visions of dinosaurs. Deep in the 19th century, oversized lizards. They kind of look a lot like this. So in fact, this is a tuatara from New Zealand. Has anyone ever seen a tuatara? 
No! Okay, I've got a response. So tuataras are in fact not most closely related to dinosaurs. Tuatara, shown in green, gives us insight into the ancestor of our lizards and snakes alive today. But in fact, not very useful when we want to think about dinosaurs. So in fact, where dinosaurs fall is most closely related to crocodiles and birds. So it's these animals that we want to think about when we're trying to make sense of what dinosaurs' secret lives might have been like and what they might have looked like. So if we look at living dinosaurs today, birds, and their closest cousins, crocodilians, then we, can, we see very different looks, very different aspects, very different ecologies or ways of being. But in fact, there's been some insights that we can take from the fossil record to help make sense of the story. There were discoveries that started being made over 20 years ago in northeastern China. And these discoveries from lakes um, up in, in the northeast, these would have been lakes from about 149 to 110 million years ago. And around these lakes, there were volcanoes. And around these lakes, dinosaurs died. And they fell into these lakes and became quickly encased in the deepening lake sediments. And what these lakes preserve, if we open them like a book, if we take these rocks out and open them gently, then you can see beautifully preserved, mineralized remains of soft tissues of dinosaurs and many other kinds of vertebrates. So this is the first feathered dinosaur discovered in 1996, a small chicken-sized dinosaur. But what it showed was remarkable. Tiny filaments covering the backside of this dinosaur. And the discoveries just kept coming. So since 1996, we now have an array of dinosaurs with filaments and bristles and fuzz of all different kinds. In fact, we even have a pony-sized tyrannosaurid with bristles. We even have a full-sized tyrannosaurid with bristles. So this is really, these discoveries could not have changed our, our insight into the secret appearance of dinosaurs more than they did. When we found dinosaurs that we knew from their bony features were more closely related to birds, we also found feathery features or features of their body covering that were more like birds as well. We found pinnate or branched feathers. This is a dromaeosaur. This is a small raptor dinosaur, much more closely related to birds. This is a troodonid. Again, you can see a small raptor dinosaur with feathers on the arm. <clears throat> so what I, what I want to do here is tie this into a bigger picture. What we found was that if these blue stars all over dinosauria, more evidence of bristles and filaments and fuzz. And in dinosaurs that were closely related to birds based on bony features, we found these branched feathers. So this is really a radical transformation in only 20 years of what dinosaurs look like. We now know that in fact scales are a rarity. So we have evidence, fossil evidence of scales, but mostly those Scales are found in groups of dinosaurs like the giant sauropods. Or they're found in ornithischian dinosaurs, which were the great group of dinosaur herbivores that we think may have gathered in large herds. So this is evidence, uh, fossil evidence of these scaly patterns. But they're rare. In fact, what we find is more groups of dinosaurs that have these bristles. And some have bristles and scales. So here's the tail, and here's a scaly part and some bristly parts. This is a reconstruction of a cetacosaur from northeast China. And this one fossil transformed our thinking about an icon. What dinosaur is that? Triceratops, right, with that, that bristly tail. So, Cetacosaurus, the dinosaur I just showed you, is closely related to Triceratops. 
So what I want you to leave here today in this first little part of the talk is I want you to leave with a notion that unlike Jurassic Park or Jurassic World, that the new vision of dinosaurs, I think they're excited for their new look. And we don't need to keep imagining them like we did in the 19th century, 150 years ago. That these new dinosaurs are beautiful, and that beauty comes from also a more scientific understanding of their secret lives. Well, of course, with dinosaurs, we don't want to just know what covered their bodies. We might want to know what color was your dinosaur. So how would we do this? In our imagination, dinosaurs can be any color we want. What color do you want your dinosaur to be? Somebody. Oh, that color. OK, that's a good color. That's a good color. But we're not, I, I, can't, I can't possibly accommodate all those requests. Sorry, sorry, dudes. So we're today instead going to talk about how we might figure out the color of an extinct dinosaur. So in fact, what we do is use our toolkit of relationships again. We look at living animals and how most living animals produce color. And the most ubiquitous or omnipresent pigment in life today, or in, in animal life, is melanin. And melanin is a very a strong biomolecule that persists in hair and skin and feathers and gives uh, is responsible for most of the colors we see in animals today. So what we can use is our knowledge of melanin in living animals to look at the past. So in this living dinosaur, <clears throat> we can see that in this, this fancy head crest here, if we took these feathers, put them under a scanning electron microscope, and we looked in very close detail, we'd see lots of round little pigment packages. These pigment packages also exist in your skin. So this is just how melanin is pushed into different kinds of body covering. So if we looked at the black regions of these feathers, we would find long, skinny pigment packages that are filled with a different kind of melanin. And if we looked at the white feathers, we'd find none of these pigment packages at all. The same is true for your hair. So if you are a redhead, you've got more little meatball-shaped pigment packages in your hair, and my hair would have more long, skinny packages. So these these rules hold because there's a relationship between the chemistry of these two kinds of melanin and the shapes of the packages into which they're packed. So let's skip that and let's get to the fossils. So here is a dinosaur fossil from those same lakes where all those dinosaurs died in the Cretaceous of China. If we look at different impressions around here, we have the preserved Im imprints of these pigment packages. And we can use them if we take tons of samples all over these dinosaurs to do what we called a color map. And to do that, what we did was take all of those samples and compare them with a large sample of living bird feathers of known color. So we look at the shape of the pigment packages and the feathers of known color, and we look at what color they produce and map that onto the dinosaur. So this is what we came up with. <clears throat> this was in 2010, and it was the first scientific-based, data-based reconstruction of the color in an extinct dinosaur. <laughs> so what did this tell us? In fact, color and appearance, in this case, can give us some insight into behavior, into these secret lives. Because large color patches, like you saw in the dinosaur I just showed, are associated with signaling and communication, attracting a mate, right? Those are forms of signals. So this is a very, a very different situation than what we have here in the case of this owl, where there are small pigment patches associated with camouflage or hiding. So behavior from these different attributes. And we find that what's striking is that we think about feathers really as being all about flight, or maybe I do. 
But, but in fact, we know that feathers originated far earlier um, and were colored as soon as they first appear with spots and stripes in the fossil record. So what this, you know, we can take this further. I'm going to give you some more evidence to bring to this story. <clears throat> so the next dinosaur we looked at was this one. This is a small raptor dinosaur, more closely related uh, to things like Velociraptor. And we took all of these samples from all over this dinosaur and found evidence that it would have had a sheeny black iridescence or gloss. And that evidence came from the fact that there were these long, super long, skinny pigment packages that were uniquely seen in birds that had iridescent color, like this duck or this chickenoid. So, in fact, we are gaining information into behavior in dinosaurs from these kinds of data. In living birds, iridescence is associated with what we call sexual selection, strong sexual selection for signaling or mate attraction. So, if we take a look at our local celebrities, you recognize this guy, right? We can think that these colors that we would have first seen 120 million years ago are still functioning today in this same system of mate attraction in dinosaurs um, that we can observe outside. Well, these are probably not the behaviors or secret lives you really wanted to hear about. I'm guessing that you might have wanted something a little bit more uh, like this. <laughs> that dinosaur was scary. But we have to remember that that dinosaur is a dinosaur of our imagination. So how might we approach this question, science secrets? What might dinosaurs sound like? So this is a new area of research for me. Um, my collaborators and I have just been looking into this topic for the past couple years, but I'm happy to share with you guys tonight for the first time what we've been thinking about. So many of you would say that that dinosaur, right, are we going to gain insights into hit sound production by studying this lion? So is this going to tell us about dinosaur sound making? No. Not, so there might be some things that we can learn, but I'll give you, spoiler alert, a couple things here. Lips. No lips in your dinosaurs. So let's see what's another, uh, you know, this is what they make most of the dinosaurs sound like in the movies, but Jurassic Park 3 took it in a new direction. Let's see if they've got the answers. I give you the resonating chamber of a velociraptor. Listen to this. Wow. This is brilliant, Billy. Really, it is. Sad to say, it's just a little bit late. So, you know, that sounded, that sound sounded a little goofy to me. Don't you prefer the roaring dinosaur? Yeah. yeah, well, remember, imagination, folks, all right? So let's look at the science, science of dinosaur sound making. Um, we just heard about a velociraptor resonating chamber that could be conveniently printed on a 3D printer and then used to make those attractive sounds. Well, let's look at work we've been doing at UT to try to render those dinosaur and close living relative sound organs. So we're not going to look at dinosaurs today, but we'll look at our living taxa or animals that are closely related to understand uh, what their vocal organs are like. They're sound makers. So this is stuff very, very new. So here we have a crocodilian, and crocodilians make what I like to call mouth sounds. Their sounds, like ours, are produced in the back of the mouth, just like that roaring lion. So in what we've done now is render in extraordinary detail the 
um, vocal folds and the tiny muscles that control and are uh, involved in sound making in crocodilians. So here's a movie done by my grad student, Jahang Lee, showing all of those tiny muscles that produce the mouth sounds of a crocodilian. When we look at birds, they sing literally from the heart. Their sound producing organ is located right next to the heart, deep in their chest. It's unique among all animals to have this kind of sound producing organ. So when we think about dinosaurs or when this feature, when this feature that is so unique to birds and involved in their incredible song arose, it's a truly fantastic question or exciting moment for me to be investigating those. So let's look at what we know now. We have these two different sound sources. Dinosaurs could have had either one. In the vision of Jurassic Park 3, I can 3D print what is called a resonating chamber. But what I want you to look at here is our sound makers, our vocal folds. After meeting with an engineer only last week, I was confronted with one reality. Vocal folds are disgusting. <laughs> they have the texture of a really loose jello and certainly could not have been in that thing that that dude was blowing into in the, in the film. And so we're actually looking into how you could 3D print multiple tissue types, but it's non-trivial, especially because of the disgusting squishiness of vocal folds. And that's true of yours as well as of a dinosaur's. So, Let's think about what are the range of sounds that a dinosaur could have produced. So here's our new vision of a dinosaur, and if they had a croc-like sound organ, they might sound like this. That sounds kind of like a roar, right? You guys are probably like, well, that's a roar. I'm, yeah, you know, she was. It's actually super interesting, this sound this roar-like sound in crocodilians is produced with the mouth closed. And in fact, part of the sound, the acoustic message, is vibration of all of the water surrounding those crocodilians. So it's an acoustic message that's sent in these multiple ways. And dinosaurs never lived in the water, so they wouldn't have had that. But just imagine a closed mouth roar, right? In fact, Big basal, big early birds, like this ostrich here today, do the same thing. That goofy, booming sound is the sound of an ostrich courtship noise. So what they do is keep breathing in, don't try this at home, and inflate their esophagus, and then resonate into that inflated esophagus. So there are a variety of ways dinosaurs could have produced sound. But this one is unlikely to have been in T-Rex. And we think that sounds silly because we're right on. In fact, the larger the animal, the lower the frequency sounds it produces in general, not in every case. So unlikely we would have had a T-Rex making these tiny sounds. So one thing we have to remember about dinosaurs, extinct dinosaurs, is things that they were different from our living dinosaurs today. They had these small brains, a small, relatively small forebrain compared to birds. So that green area is the forebrain, <clears throat> which is involved in producing uh, the comp uh, uh, it's in many aspects of producing sound making in living birds. But it gets bigger in raptors like Velociraptor, but doesn't reach that size we see in living birds. So I say this to get to my final point of the evening. T-Rex is not going to be like a parrot. And this is just a very important statement, right? I mean, you guys were probably all wondering that. Is T-Rex like a parrot? But in fact, not. You could not teach a T-Rex how to, uh, you know, like to repeat words like poly, run, or cracker. That would not work out. 
because that kind of learning ability that we see in parrots and in songbirds is very, very uh, derived, what we call it. It's not something that's in all birds. And it involves this complex pathway, a neural circuitry, and it involves coordination of these super fast muscles that are right around the vocal organ and in, in coordinating that with respira uh, respiration and modification of the, of the tract above the, the syrinx. So when you see these guys, they have all that equipment. These are essentially the primates of the dinosaurian world. And this is a point I'm going to end with this evening. Not quite. <laughs> so, you know, when one thing we can speak to in dinosaur sound production is the context for sound making. So if I, you step on my toe, I'm gonna make a noise. I'm gonna be like, ow, that hurt. If you try to steal my food, I might make a angry noise. But in general, animals do not make noise when they're attacking. So when Indominus rex or these velociraptors, these fake velociraptors are attacking, they would not be making all of these noise. I mean, if they're gonna eat you, they're just gonna eat you. <laughs> so when do, when would dinosaurs likely have made sounds? Well, we know that in living crocs and living birds, the babies communicate with the adults and, uh, in, and in little pips and squeaks and are communicating with one another. But the big context for when dinosaurs make sound is living dinosaurs and crocodilians um, is when they're attracting a mate. So I already told you about crocodilians and how they vibrate the water and make these loud booms with their mouth shut and ostriches and their crazy neck inflation. So what I want you to think about is that if they made Jurassic World the loudest and noisiest Jurassic World movie they could, it would be a very different kind of movie. <clears throat> and it might be, um, you know, not with so many scenes of, of loud, roaring dinosaurs ch chasing small children. If they wanted to eat the small children, it just would, they would just eat them. You know, there wouldn't be any, you know, sound making associated. So now I'm leaving you with our changed vision of dinosaurs. And I want to tie together some of the aspects that we talked about today. We've come a long way in the last 150 years from dinosaurs as oversized reptiles, like a lizard that just kind of barely can crawl itself, you know, out of, out of what a primordial ooze, to a vision that's, that's active, that um, has all of these different signaling, visual signaling, vocal signaling potentially um, going on. And I, this has led, you know, the extinction of the dinosaurs has led us to contemplate, you know, what would have happened if, you know, people wondered dinosaurs didn't go extinct. In the past, <clears throat> the imagination, in particular, this is the work of a paleontologist named Dale Russell, he imagined that if these dinosaurs with larger brains than, than their ancestors, kept evolving for another 65 million years, then they might look a lot like us. They might, you know, they're bipedal like us, they have these large eyes, and they might evolve this kind of human-like form. Well, in fact, dinosaurs have continued to evolve for another 65 million years, and they look nothing like us. And I, and I want us to take away that message that this is what our kind of uh, relationship with dinosaurs looks like today. And I think it's very humbling in this like final moment of imagining these dinosaurs' secret lives to think 
about, it's humbling in the sense of giving us a, a sense of our place in nature. That in fact the world is filled with dinosaurs, intelligent dinosaurs with complex communication, complex visual and vocal communication strategies. They just look nothing like us. And the real encounters between human and dinosaur are now in the Anthropocene. And if we want to see them duke it out, now's the time. That's no Jurassic world. Because humans, of course, you know, we, could, the, we weren't there. We hadn't evolved yet. So there are living dinosaurs, like this crow here, that are extremely intelligent. And they are doing exceptionally well in our very, very modified environment when many of their other species are going extinct. So I just want to leave you with that place that intelligence doesn't always look like us. That evolution didn't end up here with me. <laughs> that we live in a world of diverse cognitions, right? of different ways of interacting with the world. And with that, I want to thank you. I want to thank my lab and collaborators. And I want to encourage you, if you are interested in finding out more about dinosaur science, to follow us. I'm going to Antarctica to dig up dinosaurs for two months, leave this week. Um, you can follow us. We will be posting. We will be doing a live chat with some classrooms in Austin. Um, through a partnership with ESI, and I'm so I'm excited to continue the dialogue further. So thank you very much. All right. So, Julius, someone from the someone watching the webcast wants to know: Are birds really dinosaurs? Birds are really dinosaurs. Yes. How the heck does that work? A lot of time. <laughs> um, what we have is, you know, our early ancestors we can find in the same lake deposits in northeast, northeast China. So those same lakes that entombed all of our um, entombed our early relatives, in which we can find traces of hair, for example. They're about this size, and some of them look like beavers, but, you know, we have a, a, com a long history between us and the Cretaceous, and so similarly, birds are the same amount of time distant from that Cretaceous world. How long did a dinosaur live? Well, living dinosaurs can live a long time. <laughs> that sounds almost like a, a I don't know, a, like a riddle or something. So they, parrots and such can live 80 years. Um, from the, what we know of non-avian dinosaurs, we have growth rings in some cases that get us, you know, at least 12, 15 years um, for some of them. But others, actually closer to birds, we don't know precisely how long they would have lived. But generally speaking, smaller animals don't live as long as... Do we... Very interesting. Do we know what a dinosaur's skin feels like? Well, actually, so that's cool. You can take latex and, and the, the skin, the scaly skin that we have, um, you can actually, people have made casts of it and you can touch it and feel it and there's different museums that have touchable dinosaur skin. But remember, that's a minority of dinosaurs. Most dinosaurs would have been more cuddly. cuddly. If you could get close enough for that. I was waiting for someone to either laugh or be like, what? What is she talking about? <laughs> so um, those would be harder to replicate. Mm -hmm. Maybe bristly, like a little, some of them more like a porcupine, some a little bit more like your stuffed animal. I see. So there's been a lot of portrayals of dinosaurs in the media. Uh-huh. Is there a particular movie or show that you think, wow, they actually got it, they nailed it, or came closer, much closer than the others. Is there one that stands out for you? They tend to be science shows. Um, the, there's some really good CGI where they've brought dinosaurs to life where they're feathered, I mean, and moving around in much more realistic ways. And I can't think of a commercial, um, like a, 
a, a, mo a studio movie that does that exceptionally well. Certainly not things like The Good Dinosaur. I'm sorry if someone liked that movie. Um, but the uh, Dinosaur Train has a lot of paleontologists that are involved with that show. It's people I know. And I think the science is pretty good. A lot of Anyone watch Dinosaur Train? Yay! Yay! Yeah, Dr. Scott, I think is how he's called. He's, he's a really, he's a good guy. <laughs> Dr. Scott is a real paleontologist. He's did, actually the head of the Denver Museum of Nat Nature and Science. Did some dinosaurs like the Spinosaurus actually live in the water? Well, so that's a really interesting question. Spinosaurus is probably the one exception to my statement that uh, dinosaurs, you know, really didn't live in the water. Um, there, there's a couple of like exceptions to that, Spinosaurus being the most notable. So they found like Spinosaurus teeth in, embedded in a piece of a, of a pterosaur and there's been some suggestion that they might have had webbed feet. Um, still controversial, but, but that's one of the better supported cases of where they might have lived in the water. Uh, this question comes from Sheila. She asks, in Jurassic Park, some dinosaurs could actually change their colors in camouflage, and some could spit poison. Yep. Is that true? Well, so that's a really good question. What is it? Sheila. Sheila. So the, the, in that case, what are they thinking of? Are they thinking of a bird? Are they thinking of a crocodile? So they're modeling those dinosaurs on lizards. But what if we learned today? Dinosaurs are not super closely related to lizards. And in fact, no close relatives of dinosaurs spit poison or changed colors. So those changing colors are these things like chromatophores or embedded in the skin that allow them to, to shift. And no parts of crocodiles or birds can do that. They have colorful skin, but it doesn't change color. So unlikely dinosaur, extinct dinosaurs could have done that either. Very interesting. So Dashiell sends this question. When did dinosaurs as we think of them begin living on Earth? Okay. Um, dinosaurs, the, the earliest dinosaurs so far are known from the Triassic. So over around about 200, 230, 230 million years, so that's a pretty long time ago, yeah. And... That's a really long time, which makes me think of how long we've been doing hot science school talks. Yes, I think you should transition. <laughs> and I think perhaps this is an appropriate time. What we'll do next is we're gonna sing happy birthday to hot science school talks. Uh, that'll be followed by a little surprise and that'll be followed by some cake that HEB has provided for a thousand people. And we'll give you instructions depending on where you're sitting, where to go for cake. All right, so for now, if we have it ready, we need a musical expert to lead us in the singing. Oh. All right, so we're gonna sing happy birthday to Hot Science Cool Talks. Here's what we're gonna start the note, ready? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Hot Science Cool Talks, happy birthday to you. Good singing. That was well done. Look, at this is an amazing cake HEB made. There's lava, there's magma. How accurate are these dinosaurs? You don't want to take them home, do you? I might want to take them home, but not, not because they're so accurate. You're going to make fun of them when you take them I, home. I actually have a dinosaur bird cage in my house, so I, I keep all of my plastic dinosaurs in a bird cage. Maybe these could go on the dashboard of your car, and you can make fun of them as you're driving down the road. <laughs> Wow, that was incredible, and I think now it may be time for a special surprise. We want to say thank you so much for coming. We greatly appreciate it. Hands over here. Here we go. Three, two, one. Happy birthday to you. Happy
Thank you, everyone, very much for coming. Happy birthday.